You need two things to put on a professional wrestling show. You need characters, you need wrestlers, and you need a damn good story, and you need a damn good feud. And how many times have you seen two guys you're like, man, I really hope they have a program. That's what we're going to talk about today. Because we have three decades worth of stuff we can swim through and go through each and every year and go, well, you know what? I think that was the best feud of those 12 months, and I'm going to decide what wins and what loses. Not true. This is the thoughts and feelings of all of what culture wrestling but you will still disagree, and that's what the comments are for. But look, we've got a lot to get into, so let's just do it. Number 31, Hogan versus Warrior from 1990. Amazingly, the WWE bubble would burst after this, and that makes no sense if you just sit down and watch this classic from WrestleMania 6. I mean, it will boggle your mind if you can transport yourself back 30 years, because WWE never did title versus title as the world title took on the Intercontinental title, and they never did babyface versus babyface, and here you had two of the biggest babyfaces ever. I mean, Hogan versus Warrior, who can decide? This went further than just pro wrestling, and when you did see the Ultimate Warrior have his hand raised, you were like, my word, what's round the corner? As it turned out, it was really bad days, but it didn't feel like that at the time. It felt like the coolest thing ever, and that's why it gets in here. Number 30, Hogan versus Flair from 91. When Ric Flair did indeed leave WCW in 1991, fans around the globe got so excited because they're like, oh my gosh, hell, we can see Hulk Hogan, the biggest star of WWF, take on Ric Flair, the biggest star of World Championship Wrestling. How can that not make me feel warm and fuzzy in my tongue up? He even turned up with the WCW world title belt and started calling himself the real world's champion. <laughs> this flipping hat every day. As ever though, we just didn't go all the way. Like Hogan and Flair would fight on TV and they fight on house shows. But by the time we got to WrestleMania where they should have had their big blow off match, Vincent Mann was bored and he did a bunch of other things instead. Still context is king here and you can't take two people of this stature and not put it here, hence why I put it here. Number 29, Saruta and Friends against Masao and Friends in 1992. This had actually been going on for a few years by the time that 1992 had rolled around, but it just kept getting better and better and better and better. And it started with an extra bang here because the young Masao finally beat the legendary Saruta and fans just couldn't get enough of it. It sparked a story where the veteran vowed that he was going to take down this young plucky rookie and he was going to do that by any means necessary, which is why he went out there and got a bunch of buddies and why Masao was like, okay, well, if you're going to get you a bunch of pals, I'll go and get a bunch of friends. It resulted in numerous matches that wowed the fans and received critical acclaim to boot, and it kind of, you know, turned Masao into the absolute star that he would eventually come to be. Number 28, Bret Hart versus Jerry Lawler in 1993. A tough year for WWE as they tried replacing Hulk Hogan with Lex Luger, and that didn't work. So they tried replacing Hulk Hogan with Hulk Hogan, and that also didn't work, so they just reverted to task as they would do in the early 90s and they relied on Brett the Hitman Hart. The Hitman's King of the Ring victory kickstarted this for obvious reasons, and while it didn't blow up the box office, it did keep WWF ticking along where they really need some ticking along. The two also had a great match with SummerSlam, and the whole thing was just far better than you may expect. There was no payoff when Jerry Lawler would run into some personal problems, but they had enough moxie here that they were able to repeat it a couple of years down the line, and it wasn't as good as this, but it was still entertaining. Number 27, Hogan versus Flair in 94. See, even years later, people cared about this, although this time we were doing it in WCW and WCW did it right because Hulk Hogan's first opponent when he did make the jump was the Nature Boy. And amazingly, not only did he defeat him, but he won the world heavyweight title basically on his first night in. So it was the most Hulk Hogan thing ever, but it did work because it drew one of the best pay-per-view buy rates WCW ever did. And sure, it was kind of a little bit here and a little bit there as the year plotted on, but it then smashed it again at Halloween Havoc when they performed in a steel cage and numbers went back up. And really too, it would be another couple of years before WCW was able to present the main event that felt as important as this one. Number 26, Dreamer vs. Raven in 95. What Paul Heyman created in ECW was then borrowed by the bigger companies that allowed them to launch themselves into the stratosphere. If you need evidence of this, just go and look what he did with Tommy Dreamer versus Raven. With an elaborate backstory that dated back to their youth, just so many twists and turns, the reason they were able to have so many matches is because Tommy Dreamer could just never win. It became awesome TV and benefited the secondary bodies that kind of padded this whole thing out. And when Tommy finally got that victory, well, I had a tear in my eye. Somebody must have been cutting on you. Number 25, WCW versus the NWO in 96. Eric Bischoff wanted to create two organizations that could go to war under one roof. 
Boy, how did he get that right in 1996? Because seeing the NWO arrive to try and take down WCW not only got fans really invested, but it sort of renewed the star power of Hulk Hogan. It made Sting an even bigger star than he already was, and everybody else that was even involved, even smelling it, they benefited to boot. And sure, it ran out of steam, and it never actually really ended, but you cannot get away from this. In 1996 and 1997, Nothing in all of wrestling was any better. Number 24, Hart vs. Austin in 97. This is kind of really weird because Hogan vs. Sting over in WCW was doing crazy numbers that had a terrible payoff, whereas Bret Hart vs. Steve Austin was being seen by a lot less people, but my word, it was damn near perfect. It hit an all-time high at WrestleMania 13 when Stone Cold Steve Austin became the good guy and Bret Hart became the bad guy. And honestly, just go back and watch this now. Watch every single match they do. None of them are bad, it tells the best story ever, and both dudes just understand their role so well. It is such a shame that the Hitman did leave for WCW when he did, because you could have rolled this back time and time again, and it never would have sucked. Number 23, Austin vs. My Man in 98. One of the best and most profitable feuds in all of wrestling history, Stone Cold Steve Austin was the best good guy, Vince McMahon was the best bad guy, everybody loved it. Even wrestling fans became wrestling fans because of these two. Everybody wanted to see the blue collar Austin beat up his boss because secretly in their own lives that's what they wanted to do too. And think of the other people that came along because of this. The Rock, The Big Show, Kane, Mankind, there's a bunch of people that all went into this and came out the other side smelling of roses. It was so successful it would carry on for years and was the catalyst for WWF finally stopping WCW's 83 week winning streak. I mean, come on. Number 22, Austin vs. McMahon in 1999. Hence why it's here again. I mean, seriously, try and argue it. It continues to make all the money in the world. Seeing Stone Cold Steve Austin fight through Vince McMahon at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre before winning back his belt at WrestleMania 15 was excellent. And while during this period, we did have to have nonsense of Vince McMahon revealing himself as the higher power. It was me, Austin, it was me all along. Equally, that's the best thing ever. Just don't tell anyone. And it would be diminishing returns after this, but the numbers do not lie. Go and find a spreadsheet and look at them. Because of all of this, they were making so much flipping cash. The 21 Triple H versus The Rock in 2000. As WWE reached their commercial peak, the big question was, well, what the hell are we gonna do now? We've lost Stone Cold Steve Austin. What did happen is they took Triple H and they made The Rock and allowed them to absolutely kill it. The pair are at the top of the card for half of the pay-per-views in 2000. And while really it should have just been a one-on-one -on -one contest at that year's WrestleMania, we did get it a backlash and that was really good. So they earned their position and also had that manic Iron Man match at Judgment Day, which also finished off with the return of The Undertaker. And again, you see, we were using this as a platform for every day. I mean, it was a nuts 12 months and you can pick any pay-per-view and get evidence of that. If it wasn't for Triple H and The Rock, who the hell knows what would have happened? Number 20, WWE versus The Alliance in 2001. So this was a mess. We've talked about it forever, but certain triggers weren't pulled. But you can't pretend otherwise. From a fan standpoint, they couldn't believe this was actually going to happen. It dominated the entire year, though, and got people super involved. And once again, the numbers don't lie. And I know, I get it. You can say, yeah, but Simon, they were probably just watching, hoping that Goldberg would turn up. And that is true, but they still watched. If WWE had actually remembered that they had defeated WCW in real life, this would have been far better within the story. They just kept thumping them down. But look, I was alive for this. I remember the buzz. It was pretty damn incredible. The 19, Raw vs. SmackDown in 2002. Austin was gone, The Rock was headed to Hollywood, and WWE needed something to keep interest alive. And they found it in the first ever brand split. And yeah, it's been treated ridiculously over the years, but fans did buy into this as a thing, especially because WWE presented it as a thing. This idea of Raw vs. SmackDown has never been more aggressive than it was in 2002. I mean, it started with Vince vs. Flair, and then it segued into Bischoff vs. Stephanie, but we also had separate writing teams behind the scenes, so you could watch Monday nights, and it actually felt different to Fridays, Wednesdays, whatever the hell SmackDown used to be on. So it had a unique feel, it worked. In many ways, it did fill the void left by WCW. So yeah, there was something here. It would be run into the ground, but you can't say that back then. Number 18, Masawa vs. Kabashi in 2003. It's hard to explain this unless you've seen it, but come 2003, this war had kind of been going on for a decade. 
that is something else. All of that too was basically Kabashi trying to defeat Masawa, and when he finally did, it was like the earth had shattered in two, especially because Masawa said, okay, fine, I'm now gonna spend every single waking hour trying to win this back. It pushed Noah into a new gear and it captivated fans, and also the people booking this knew when to let things lie, and when can you ever say that about a main event feud? It also meant everybody wanted more, but they weren't giving it to them. If nothing else, if you fancy your wrestling portrayed a little bit differently to what we're used to over here in the West, you owe it to yourself to watch this. It is pretty damn special. Seven, Foley vs. Orton in 2004. This just rocked. Not only did it feature that banger at WrestleMania where they both tried to kill each other, but coming out the other side, Randy Orton felt like a bigger star. Never forget that's all wrestling is. Foley was as nuts as ever as he allowed Randy Orton to kick him down those stairs, and to this day I don't know how that didn't hurt. And don't forget that year's WrestleMania, you also had the Rock and Sock Connection taking on Evolution. This is big time. You could also argue that Orton has never looked back since, and that's all thanks to what Mick Foley did in 2004. Hence why it's going on the board. Number 16, Triple H versus Batista in 2005. And on that note, just a year later, Triple H was doing the same for Batista. And this was so good and it was so well received that even the biggest detractors of the Reign of Terror thought to themselves, well, I know that Triple H has wrecked all these guys that I would have enjoyed seeing pushed, but now that's kind of all been passed on to Batista, so it's okay. Their Mania match was also top draw, as was every single fight they had afterwards. And when all was said and done, there was no two ways about it. Batista was in the main event and he would stay there forever. It's also the reason that when Big Dave wanted to retire, he wanted to have a match with Triple H and do the honors for him. It was just coming full circle. Number 15, Edge versus Cena in 2006. This feud established both guys. It told you that one of them was not just a one hit wonder and it told you the other one was far more than a B plus player. Every match they had was better than the last. You had all the madness with the money in the bank briefcase that felt so exciting. And when they finally went their separate ways, WWE had two wrestlers they could now do so much more with. This was pretty damn good booking. There was also plenty of shocks along the way and really this gets massively overlooked, which is why I put it in here. If it's made your brain go, huh, what's he talking about? The WWE Network is your friend. Number 14, Undertaker versus Batista in 2007. This rocked. After The Undertaker had won the Royal Rumble, he had three behemoths he could have gone after. John Cena, Bobby Lashley or Batista, I'm really glad he picked the latter. They flipped off management right away because after their WrestleMania match got moved from the main event right into the mid card, they promised that they'd go out there and try and steal the show. And they basically did. And they had such good chemistry every time they were in the ring. Well, it was just great. Low expectations probably helped because very unfairly, everyone thought this was gonna suck, but it didn't. And all that really matters is that when you sit down, you're entertained. And that's what The Undertaker and Big Dave did every time. Number 13, Jericho versus Michaels in 2008. This was so good and it happened almost in spite of itself. It's one of those few occasions where WWE actually trusted their employees instead of looking at their running sheet and going, well, actually, we didn't want to do this, and so we're not going to. Because originally planned for one match, it managed to turn so many heads the company did go forward with it. And although we had a proper winner by the end, morally, everything was thrown out the car here. Although Jericho did win that one, because not only did he smash the hot rope kid's head into a TV, he also punched his wife. It also saw Y2J claim the world title and finally be treated like he deserved it. And honestly, it's another one where you can just go back and watch it today. It hasn't aged at all. Number 12, Hardy versus Punk in 2009. A lean year for stories across the board. This sleeper feud just built and built until people couldn't get enough of it. It was as much about CM Punk establishing himself as a world champion was also trying to shame Jeff Hardy. They had some great matches while trading SmackDown's main prize back and forth and basically elevated themselves in the process. Once again, I don't think this was the plan because as soon as both had some backstage issues, WWE dragged them back down. But your eyes don't deceive you and your eyes don't lie. Because everything that was happening on screen was great. Number 11, John Cena versus The Nexus from 2010. Now it was the biggest feud in the year, but that's why the payoff, the conclusion, the result, the end of really pissed off fans because it should have been the moment that John Cena used his star power to create someone equal to him, or at least try. And it didn't have to be Wade Barrett. You could have picked any of the members from the Nexus. They just needed to get some kind of visual pinfall over John Cena, especially because up to this point, they had been doing great. Do you remember how they debuted? Daniel Bryan even got fired because he took things too far. Just great. But it didn't end up like that. John Cena won and he continued to do his John Cena thing. You can't see me. And now Wade Barrett's not even in the company. Once 
suppose he is an NXT commentator, but that man deserves so much more, which is why I secretly hope he makes a comeback soon. But hey, this did capture the attention of the audience. It just didn't go the way it should have done. Number 10, CM Punk vs WWE in 2011. <laughs> I just said three seconds ago, it didn't go the way it should have done. Welcome to 2011 and welcome to CM Punk. But yes, when Punk did do his pipe bomb promo in June of this year, everybody looked at the man like, oh my gosh, we have something here. Quick, make sure we set everything on fire because this dude's about to go right to the top. And he did, and he did some amazing things. Kevin Nash, Alberto de Rio, blah, blah, so on and so forth. You already know the deal. We don't need to talk about it, but we are talking about the best feuds of the year. Nothing was better than the summer of punk. I mean, when you think about it, the reason people are desperate for him to come back now is everything he did in this 12 month period. And you can still go back and watch his whole promo thing and it will make you all giddy. It's just so good. Number nine, The Rock versus Cena in 2012. You can't not put this here given who was in it because The Rock is a massive star. John Cena is a bigger star. And where we were at the time with professional wrestling, I don't think you could have topped this no matter who you would have been able to bring in. It also managed to make everyone go nuts because they built it for an entire year and let's not pretend otherwise. When it was good and these two were doing those incredible promo battles, my word, it got you invested. And you can even say at some point Cena out promoed the great one and you never thought that would be the case especially when he wrote down those notes on those wrists. And there's a conspiracy theory about that now. Did they plan this beforehand? I doubt it very much. Just go and watch Dwayne Johnson's reaction. Number eight, Tanahashi versus Okada in 2013. A year prior to this, Okada challenged Tanahashi for his IWGP championship. And do you know what the reaction was? Everybody went, <laughs> what is it? What is that? I can't. Oh, you got to be kidding me. And then didn't we all look foolish? Because 12 months on, they had had some matches that were absolutely incredible. And now they were trading the title with each other. And once again, do you know what Tanahashi did for Arcada? He made him serious. He made him believable and turned him into this thing that he is today. Arguably one of the best wrestlers ever. They also had four singles matches in one year, which would be overkill anywhere else. But it wasn't. It all just worked. And this is where you just have to tap your hat to Booker Gado. He knew that Akada had something, and you could argue that it was here where it all came out. Number seven, WWE versus the audience in 2014. Or you can call it Daniel Bryan versus one of many people, but it was really here where the crowd decided, we don't like what you're doing, World Wrestling Entertainment, to the point we're even going to boo Rey Mysterio when he arrives at number 30 in the Royal Rumble. Do not forget, nobody boos Rey Mysterio. He's flipping great. But it was really here where the likes of Triple H and Stephanie McMahon started to acknowledge that there was a very big disconnect between management and the people sat in the crowd and look we did get a good few things out of it that Daniel Bryan went at WrestleMania 30 is one of the best things ever but this feud is kind of continuing now and when it comes to World Wrestling Entertainment of Vince McMahon it may never stop it does make it a lot of fun though especially if you go on Reddit number six Bailey versus Banks from 2015 it just came down to chemistry it just came down to great matches and it just came down to top draw characters throughout all this period Sasha Banks transformed into the boss and was such an absolute piece of trash and on the flip side the juxtaposition you had Bailey who was a fun loving happy child hugging just super duper person who you wanted to see desperately win and for so long she just couldn't. The two also stole the show when NXT TakeOver headed to the Barclays Center and if you've never seen this you have to go back in time and watch it especially given what they're doing in 2020. There's a reason it resonated so well today and it begun a good five years ago. Number five, Cena versus Styles from 2016. This was just so good if you were a long time wrestling fan because on one side of the ring you had John Cena who represented WWE and on the other was AJ Styles, a dude who was considered so affiliated with the indie scene or not WWE, no one ever thought he'd actually make it. Then he did, then he became world champion, he had these bangers with John Cena, he went after Cena for being the face that runs the place. It was money and it was gold. The fact it did end with AJ Styles becoming the WWE Champion too should still blow your mind. This was a guy that debuted at the Royal Rumble and Vince McMahon thought the reaction that he got was a fluke. Boy, did he turn that round with AJ Styles. Like I've said about a lot of people on this list, who's one of the best wrestlers ever. And before Omega versus Okada in 2017. I mean, it basically changed everything. These two had matches so good that people still debate which one is the best match ever. So it's not like we bring other wrestlers into it. They look at the matches that Carter and Omega have and go, is that one the best one ever? Was this one the best one ever? And if you want to make some claim that it's the reason AEW was born, or at least one of the reasons, 
Well, you probably could. What else can I say about it? If you haven't seen it, you should go and see it. Even if you never watched New Japan before, it will absolutely captivate you. And once you get into the story and the in-ring narrative, but nothing topped this that year. Maybe not the year after either. Number three, Gagano versus Champa in 2018. I mean, this was cursed in many ways because it kept getting derailed, but let's face it, when Champa did indeed turn on Gargano, not only did it rip fans' hearts and just chuck them on the floor, it created an absolute monster in Tommaso and Johnny became the perfect babyface. This is just ticking boxes. It also resulted in an absolute classic unsanctioned match at TakeOver New Orleans, and that's really what I'm focusing on here. There was no other match within this 12-month period that had the emotion that they did, and people were desperate for Gagana to win, and that is such a rare thing nowadays, especially in WWE. Everybody rooting for the heel. And it's a shame that we never really got the payoff that we needed again because life got in the way. You can just immerse yourself in this moment and it will make you feel pretty good. Number two, Cole versus Gargano from 2019. Now I know this because I was sat there during WrestleMania weekend and I saw it firsthand. And you had thousands of people on a building who were completely bought into Adam Cole. They had completely bought into Johnny Gargano. And when Johnny Gargano finally won the big one, Honestly, I cried, and I'm not ashamed to say that, men can cry too. And I get it, I know, some people thought it went a little too far and it went a little too crazy, but it really did cement Adam Cole's position in NXT, and it just reminded you that no matter what you want to do with Johnny Gargano, he will find a way to make it work, including this year being just the best asshole heel your ass has ever seen. Number one, Paige versus Omega in 2020. Now this one isn't really over at the moment, but flipping hell, what other stories go this deep? What other stories are this layered? And who even knows where the hell it's gonna end up? It probably will be another 12 months when Hangman Page defeats Kenny Omega for the world title. And my word is that long-term storytelling. But it also ties into friendship, the idea of loss, alcoholism, addiction. You can just keep going through this and to top it all off, did they ever have a bad match? Be that when they were a tag team or when they were going against each other? No, they did not, because they are two, simply put, phenomenal wrestlers. It's also now resulted in a hangman page who is trying to find himself and Kenny Omega going back to being the cleaner. Don't pretend otherwise, you've been asking for this for months, years, now you've got it. And there you go, every single feud that kind of smashed the place year by year. I know we will have forgotten some, but that's what the comments are for. And you like the video, you share the video, and you subscribe, you head over to whatculture.com, you read yourself some articles, follow What Culture on Twitter, WhatCulture WWE, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. No idea what I was just doing with my hands, but it felt good. And don't forget, that's what life is all about. I will see you soon.